Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're going to hold a bit of a respectful and civil debate. I'm going to take the position that we should be focused on preventing wars and defunding militaries, even at the expense of working to reform wars. My guest, Leonard Rubenstein, can articulate his position for himself momentarily, but it includes support for reforming war to protect healthcare workers and patients. Rubenstein is the author of a terrific new book called Perilous Medicine, The Struggle to Protect Healthcare from the Violence of War. He is professor and director of the Program on Human Rights and Health in Conflict at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. In 2011, he founded and now chairs the Safeguarding Health in Conflict Coalition, a group of 40 humanitarian human rights health provider organizations working at the national and global levels that seeks to reduce attacks on and interference with with health workers, patients, facilities, and transports. Uh, Leonard Rubenstein was previously president of Physicians for Human Rights and is a recognized global expert on violence against healthcare. Leonard Rubenstein, welcome to Talk World Radio. I'm delighted to be with you, David. Uh, delighted to have you on. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for coming on. Let me give you my position in 30 seconds, and then you take as long as you want to tell me why I'm wrong. In my view, as I imagine you agree, the real problem is the war makers and the war profiteers and the war facilitators and the vast silent and apathetic majority. If war abolishers and war reformers disagree, that is hardly the biggest problem out there and we can agree to disagree quite amicably and carry on with our work. But if asked why I favor putting everything into war abolition, I'd point out that shifting just a fraction of war spending into health spending could do more good than any war reforms. I'd point out that the public pressure in 2013 that prevented massive bombing in Syria or in 2015 and at other times that prevented a war on Iran and all the endless efforts that eventually removed troops from Afghanistan have done worlds of good. And I would note the totally unnecessary harm done by most war reformers, uh, including in your book, in baselessly announcing that war is inevitable, so we must carry on with war, but reform it. What am I missing? Uh, you know, uh, David, I don't think we disagree on all that much that the, the only disagreement I think may be that I don't think the position that we should try to abolish war while at the same time trying to protect people caught up in war, those positions are not mutually exclusive. And if you go back to the very beginnings of the Geneva Convention in the 1860s, and of course the Geneva Conventions are the rules of war to protect non-combatants, prisoners of war, uh, health providers, patients, wounded and sick, civilians. That's what the Geneva Conventions are. The, the father, as it were, of the Geneva Conventions, a man named Henri Dunant, was a pacifist. But I just want to read a phrase that he wrote. He said, unhappily, we cannot avoid all, always avoid wars, so we must press forward in a human, and he said, truly civilized spirit to attempt to prevent or at least alleviate the horrors of war. So I don't see that, that's my view. I would, I've in many circumstances worked against war going back to Vietnam. Uh, but I also think that if there's gonna be war, there are ways of making it less uh, lethal to civilian populations and to those who care for them. So uh, that's how I see it. I think we should try to end war and we should try to stop arms sales. And there have been some successes sometimes over years, like in arms sales to Yemen, although it's not over yet. I mean, to Saudi Arabia for the war in Yemen. But I think that mine is the position of do not that let's try to end war as much as we can 
Let's redirect war spending to civilian needs, including healthcare, of course. And let's also recognize that war has a horrific impact on health. But when there is war, let's try to limit the harms. And I think we have a good record in history that at least sometimes, unfortunately, not enough, uh, those rules do save thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives. It's the, it's the as much as we can, uh, if we really take that seriously, that's a sticking point, of course, uh, because if we're focused on the rules of war and proper adherence to the rules of war, uh, we're not focusing those exact same energies and staff time and, and funding and organizational uh, focus on uh, preventing war and reducing military spending and so forth. And I, I think in fairness, in your book, you say both, uh, both of which I, I think cannot be proven, uh, that will never end war and will never reform war to the point where war makers stop targeting health professionals and patients and so forth. So, so both are impossible. But it seems, it seems that the nature of war when you're organizing mass killing and the mentality that's required for that is what makes it very difficult to reform, uh, to reform it to the point where certain people are respected while others are murdered. Uh, whereas the idea of societies living without war, well, we've seen countless societies uh, even today and, and certainly throughout history and prehistory that have lived without war. Uh, and, and there just seems to be no basis for asserting. It seems to be a gratuitously harmful remark to, to which you find in every book on reforming war, that war will never be eliminated. Well, of course, I can't predict the future. I can only look at the past uh, and the history of the last few thousand years is all kinds of wars. And um, the fact that we've had all these wars does not mean we shouldn't use what, our energy to prevent them. And in, you mentioned Afghanistan to try to end them, uh, the same in the Saudi war in Yemen and, and uh, the wars in the Middle East. Uh, yes, we should use our energy. I guess where our disagreement is, is your position sounds like a zero sum game that for every moment that you focus on protecting healthcare in law in war, you could have used that time to try to prevent war or end war. I don't see the energy available as finite. I also think there are different roles for different actors. Uh, and there, with respect to protection of healthcare and war, you can develop alliances with groups and people and, and, and constituencies and politicians who are not going to be persuaded to end war, but are willing to work to protect people caught up in war. So it's a matter of not having a finite amount of energy um, and I think there's a cost to, to the position that we shouldn't try to limit the horrors of war. And I'll just give you an example. Um, in, in going back to the Second World War, um, millions of people were killed in strategic bombing in Japan and in uh, Germany. The Korean War, very few people know about the fact that 18 cities in North Korea were destroyed, roughly a million people were killed, estimated a thousand hospitals were destroyed. Uh, incendiary bombing and napalm was used extensively. And of course, people do know about Vietnam, the millions of cluster bombs and the use of napalm. But since then, the one major change in practice, at least in uh, this country, which has a very uh, checkered, to say the least, poor record in uh, conduct of war and starting wars, 
it's rare for for bombing to be used strategically and as a result that the numbers of casualties uh, from airstrikes these days over the last 10, 20 years has have been counted in the thousands, which is terrible. We shouldn't be hitting civilians. Uh, we shouldn't be killing people in drone strikes. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, destroying hospitals through mistakes. Uh, but the numbers are of a magnitude that is uh, uh, lower than uh, in past wars from hundreds of thousands to low thousands, maybe maybe in Iraq and uh, the battle against ISIS could be 10,000 or, or more. But the, the order of magnitude is so different that we can't give up on protections. Uh, and in so many other conflicts, we can see that if there were commitment to obey the rules of war, uh, so many lives could be saved. And I'll give you an example. I, I mentioned the Saudis in Yemen, and I mentioned that because, um, among other things, the US, as well as the British and other Europeans, uh, poured billions of dollars of arms, uh, bombs, military support, mid air refueling, uh, precision guided weapons. And the Saudis used those weapons completely indiscriminately. And they destroyed the water system in Yemen, resulting in 2 million cases of cholera, the biggest in the world, the largest cholera epidemic ever seen, uh, the destruction of the entire health system. Uh, malnutrition in Yemen remains rampant. There are very few resources to treat it. Um, would I like to prevent, stop that war? Most people think the war is not only horrific in the way it's conducted, but ridiculous even uh, from the Saudi point of view, of their political objectives. So I, I, I think we have to do both. And, and, I, 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 and it makes a difference to do both. And uh, there are different roles in, for people, there are different, but but we can we can we can do both, and I think we should do both because the ultimate goal is to save people's lives, and I think that's what we have to do. Well, we do have a lot of agreement. I certainly agree with you that uh, the resources are potentially infinite. Uh, in that, again, the biggest problem is the vast majority of people who aren't doing anything, who, who aren't trying to end war or reform war, and all of the people invested in promoting wars and facilitating wars. And I think the two can be complementary. That is, you ought to be more engaged in wanting to end war if you learn about the attacks on health workers and if you. You learn about the, the torture and you learn about the various atrocities that people want to reform out of war, those are additional reasons to want to end war. So the two can build each other and, and work together. Um, but I but there but I do have disagreements about the numbers, right? And these are these are things that uh, we can't say with absolute certainty, but are worth looking into because there's a a dramatic difference between uh, looking at the, the deaths or injuries uh, in a war like the war on Iraq that are reported in the newspapers and that are then collected by something like Iraq body count and, and, and that you know, organizations that openly admit that they are radical underestimates of the deaths because they're just the ones that happen to be reported. And then the more scientific surveys that are done uh, to the great consternation of the US government that go in and find totals that are in the hundreds of thousands and millions. Uh, and most of these wars don't have those studies done at all. Uh, and so you have to take the reported deaths and guesstimate how many times you need to multiply them to get at the actual deaths and injuries uh, and trauma and homelessness and, and disease and so forth. Uh, but, but to suggest that there are recent US-led wars uh, where the casualties are only in the hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, uh, 
uh, I mean, this is this is happier than than Steven Pinker on his on his happiest day. I mean, who, where, where would those numbers come from? I mean, that the most credible estimates seem to put each of these wars uh, above a million. Uh, certainly, the war on Iraq, um, and, and it, it does matter that we get these numbers right, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um... And I, I want to address the numbers, but before we get to that, I want to talk a minute about some other area of real agreement, Okay, <laughs> which is there has been increasing attention to the indirect effects of war on uh, both deaths and, and, um, and illness and, and, and mor morbidity. Uh, for example, uh, there was an amazing study uh, by the International Rescue Committee on the war in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, still going on, but this was about 20 years ago, where they found that the numbers of people who died from infectious diseases, the increase from what it had been before the war was in the hundreds of thousands. It may be may have been a million, I can't remember. So the indirect effects of war are just stunning because of uh, the displacement of populations, the reappearance of infectious diseases that had not been prevalent, like in Syria, there are diseases that have come back. The lack of ability to do polio vaccinations or measles vaccinations. So these indirect effects don't even involve um, the attacks on healthcare. They're, they're the effects of war. So I think that's another area of agreement. <laughs> Absolutely. So not, not to but, mention the health benefits if you took 5% of military spending and put it into, into health spending. Absolutely. So now let's talk about the casualties. I'll, I'll give two examples. One is Afghanistan. Uh, the... The, the, the UN uh, Human Rights Agency uh, did remarkable work in tracking civilian casualties in Afghanistan from all parties. And they issued quarterly reports. And these were counts based on really good on the ground um, reporting uh, by various informants and staff and they are considered incredibly uh, credible. Whatever you think of the UN, the, the, human, the High Commissioner for Human Rights is known for its credibility and for its uh, sound reporting. And they did report large numbers of civilian casualties. Um, and they, just, they counted them uh, whenever they could uh, by perpetrators. So they had state armed forces, you know, international forces, Taliban, other uh, non-state armed groups like Al Qaeda or ISIS or whoever else was there, and uh, and their reports are excellent, and they did report uh, um, tens of thousands over the course of the last few years. There've been more than forty thousand civilian casualties. I can't remember how many years. I just looked the other day, but I can't remember what was five years or exactly what the time period was. But 40,000 civilian casualties is nothing to be happy about. And yet, and that's all civilian casualties. And yet, that is a different level of, and of those, some of them were attributable to international forces and some to, to uh, domestic uh, security forces. And they're terrible. I mean, we can't excuse a single one of them, but they're not of the scale of Vietnam. And similarly, in the battle against ISIS in Iraq and um, uh, Eastern Syria, which was brutal in Mosul and Raqqa, those cities were leveled. And there too, there were civilian casualties and the US military said, oh, there were a thousand. But even, not even, the credible 
organizations like Amnesty International that really, and, and Air Wars and other groups that were responsible in tracking casualties, put the number in around, at a, in, in Raqqa, for example, at around 10 or 12,000. Again, terrible. It shouldn't have been that level. But the scale is different. And I'm not for a moment excusing those casualties. I'm just saying that to some extent, not as much as we would like, but to some extent, the rules have made some difference. My whole book is about how the rules of war are not being properly followed. But in this conversation, I want to recognize that there has been some, some difference made. I, I do, wouldn't dispute it for a second. Uh, and even the numbers that I consider far more likely than the numbers you're using uh, do not approach uh, the numbers from Vietnam and, and Southeast Asia. Uh, there's no question, and I'm very glad they don't. Um, uh, but I, I, I do, I, I, and again, I think these two paths of reforming war and ending war can be complementary, but it, it has a little bit to do with how we talk about them and how we think about them. Uh, and the focus on civilian casualties, while I understand it, uh, it, it comes out of a different mentality than the mentality of wanting to abolish war because there's a problem with killing human beings whether those human beings are civilians or not. Uh, and so the notion that I have to be more upset if somebody gets defined as a civilian, uh, it, it, that I have to get be more upset if somebody is unarmed, that I have to be more upset if somebody is in a hospital or working in a hospital, uh, that there are types of people whose killing uh, it is objectionable, and other types of people who is, it's at least less objectionable, if not downright right, glorious and righteous. Uh, you know, this is not the mentality of someone who's trying to abolish war because they're against killing human beings. Uh, and, and in fact, it fits better with the mentality of the supporters of one side of a war, where the people on my side it's absolutely atrocious and outrageous that they should be killed or injured or harmed in any way. But the people on the other side, well, that's that's the business of war is to kill those evil people on the other side or regretfully we must in humanitarian fashion murder all those people on the other side. That's that's a war mentality, not a war abolition mentality. Uh, I agree. Uh, and I think it's a really profound point that you make, which is that at the, the fundamental uh, basis of the laws of conduct of war is that there are certain people you can't harm, civilians, wounded people, and certain people it's completely legitimate to kill, and that is opposition soldiers. <laughs> and in fact, one of the differences between human rights law and the law of war is that if you kill uh, 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 an enemy, uh, as, you know, when a, a, a police officer kills a black person, that's murder. <laughs> it's it's and it's extrajudicial execution in the in the language of human rights. Whereas in the law of war, if that person is your enemy. In a war, you have a perfect right to kill them and you can't be held accountable. So I take that point and we recognize that that's important to recognize because uh, you're killing not only other soldiers, we say that to other soldiers, but what you're really doing is killing kids. You're killing 17, 18 year old kids in war and you know they're cannon fodder. So, so I mean, I do take that point, um, but it goes back to the initial question whether if that's going to continue, and we can disagree whether it will continue, uh, even though we don't want it to continue, um, then you want to at least have some restraints. And the restraints are you can only kill combatants. And I completely acknowledge that that has a stunning human cost, but uh, 
uh, we want to prevent that cost from being extended to other people. Right. I uh, to get to get back to to Yemen for one second uh, because I think it is an important topic to bring up the so-called Saudi war on Yemen. There are top officials in the U.S. military and have been for years and years who have said that Saudi Arabia could not even be waging this war without U.S. participation, without U.S. support uh, in in identifying targets and maintaining equipment and airplanes uh, and refueling those airplanes uh, and not just not just selling the weaponry to Saudi Arabia, but participating in the war, there could not be this sort of war. Uh, and in fact, you had for the first time since 1973, both houses of Congress repeatedly used the War Powers Resolution to end the US participation and presumably then the war itself on Yemen when they could count on a veto from then President Donald Trump. And as soon as we got a new president, poof, that whole effort disappeared from Congress. Uh, and you saw more of these, you know, reform it around the edges, uh, amendments to other bills and, you know, minor sort of tweaks and talk about doing it properly, but not ending it. Uh, and, and so I always, I, it, you know, great frustration because of all the people being killed directly and indirectly and starved and, and, and through disease. I'm just wishing there were a bit more effort to say to the U.S. Congress, for God's sake, why does a new president have to change the moral necessity that you saw months ago to end this war? And, and so that's why I want a few more people in the end the wars movement, you know? Well, I think on Yemen that, and so the story is that's completely right, that uh, I don't have any doubt but that uh, the United States government was complicit in, in the war and whether the war would have continued without U.S. support, it's hard to say because the British were pouring so many arms into uh, the Saudi um, armaments <laughs> then uh, that it might have continued. But there is a movement and I think it continues uh, to stop that, at least U.S. support for that war. Uh, just this year, uh, uh, the House again voted to cut off arms. It's voted many times in the past. Trump always vetoed the legislation. So where that stands now is it passed the House and now it's in the Senate. So the question is, can the votes in the Senate uh, to cut off the arms, which they have uh, voted in the past to do, uh, cannot be had in this defense bill. So, so I think the advocacy to end the support for this war has to continue. And I hope all your listeners will do that to push the Senate to agree to this cutoff. And, and uh, that's as important as worrying about what exactly they're bombing, what structures they're bombing. Absolutely. I, I wish we could go on. I'm afraid we're, at, we're out of time. We've been speaking with Leonard Rubenstein, uh, and I'm grateful to him both for his book and for being willing to, to do a debate without uh, cursing and calling names and throwing things, as we are taught on television, you must do in debates. And uh, again, the book that everybody should pick up is called Perilous Medicine, The Struggle to Protect Healthcare from the Violence of War by our guest Leonard Rubenstein. Leonard, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you. And it's been a wonderful conversation. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Dot org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.